So we're starting a brand new series this morning that I am ecstatic about. And uh, we're, going, we're calling this series uh, a kind of an unusual thing. It's called, Who Was Jesus? Who Are You? Who was Jesus? Who are you? So we're going to be t- taking a look at the historical, historical picture of Jesus and then look at how then it fleshes itself out every day in my life because I'm supposed to be imitating him. Isn't that correct? Yes? All right. So the, the one way or one way that I describe Jesus, and I do this on a regular basis, I would say that Jesus, when he walked this planet in particular, was very intentional, even missional along the way. Jesus, everything he did had a purpose. It wasn't haphazard. He was on a mission. He was, he was externally focused and he was culturally relevant. He leaves the culture of heaven and comes to this planet. I want you to think about just the, the nature of the gospel. The nature of the gospel is, is that Jesus leaves the culture of heaven behind and he enters this planet. I mean, can you imagine the difference between the culture of heaven and this planet? I mean, that's, that's a cultural shock, right? So Jesus became culturally relevant to the planet that he, w- that he came to, and uh, he went to people that didn't want to be spoken to. He was, he was externally focused in every way. It wasn't about him. It was never about him. It was about him doing the will of the Father, and it was about you and I receiving this amazing gift of salvation. His whole incarnation into the world and his mission to save us is hard to, is hard to miss when you read your Bible. It really is. When you just open the Gospels, it's hard to miss that Jesus was missional and externally focused and culturally relevant. And in any way, in every way, he was, he was beyond his years. He was, it was amazing. That's who he was. Do you understand that? Yes? He was culturally relevant and externally focused. Jesus loved to teach people by story. So I'm going to tell you a story today that Jesus taught. And so I want to give you a context for the story. And this really is going to capture, I think, what I'm going to be speaking about today. So the reality is, is that Jesus is about ready to be crucified. When he tells this story, it's probably either Tuesday or Wednesday of crucifixion week. He has raised Lazarus from the dead just the week previous to that. And the religious leaders of his day want to kill him. And here's why. You would think, why would they want to kill him? Because they hated his message. And they knew that now that this miracle was happening and this miracle was spreading like wildfire, now that this miracle has happened, they couldn't stop him. And he had this momentum going and it was just amazing. And so Jesus now is having his life plotted against. And he teaches a parable that's directed towards Pharisees and religious leaders of his day. And oh, by the way, in the midst of that, we find we get a glimpse into his mission on this planet and we get a glimpse as to how we fit into that mission on this planet. So it's found in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you brought your Bible, you're welcome to turn there with me. Matthew chapter number 22. It'll be on the screen if... uh, you, you prefer to look at it larger than life. And so actually you're going to get a blessing because my face is going to come off the screen for a few minutes. And that's a gift. I'm just saying there's some gifts that you just give people. And that's a gift I'm giving you today. Thank you. So you can say thank you later. So in Matthew chapter 22, this is what it says. Jesus is speaking. These are Jesus's words. Uh, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. Jesus sets a store, the stage, and this is a story. And, and in many passages or many versions of the Bible, this is called a parable. Jesus oftentimes spoke in parables because he wanted certain people to know and certain people not to know. This was directed towards people who hated him. And you can see why. You'll see why as we read the story. It says this. This is the story. It's the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. Jesus comes into the world. He comes unto his own, the Bible says, and his own does not receive him. He, he prepares for them a banquet. The banquet represents in our story, in this particular story, the banquet represents the offer of the kingdom 
which is the major theme through both, both the, the Gospels and nearly all the epistles. It is the kingdom of God. If you want to know what does the Bible speak of, the Bible speaks of the kingdom of God, both here and now and in the future. So the banquet is this invitation to join the kingdom. And they refused. The ones he came to refused. So he sent other servants to them uh, uh, to tell them that the feast had been prepared. The bulls and the fattened calf and cattle had been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. He wants them to come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their way. One to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious. Rightfully so. Now we're, going, we're, we're transitioning back and forth in this parable between that which is to come and that which already was. And so now he says the king was furious and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, and this is where you and I come into the story. We're his servants. If you know Jesus, look at me in the eye. If you know Jesus, you're his servant. You are a servant of the living God. So this is what he says to his servants. The wedding feast is ready and the guests I've invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go in, out into the corners, street corners, and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. My job description as a servant of Jesus in the age that we live is to go out in every place that I can go and use my influence, my talent, my ability, my voice, my lifestyle, and to invite people to the banquet. That's my lifestyle. That's my goal. And that should be your mission. The mission that God leaves the church with is a mission that's nearly impossible. That's okay. Because it's done by the power of the Spirit. The mission that God has left the church with is the idea of going into the four corners of the world, the street corners, places that nobody else goes, and inviting people that nobody else wants and invite them to this banquet. And God ferrets them out. God sorts them out. That's okay. You and I don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about who God is going to save and who he's not going to save. My job is to invite them to the banquet. That's your job description. Your job description as a child of God is to be diligent in, and, and put your energy into not building your kingdom. I got news for you. Here's a news flash. Everything you build that's not God's kingdom someday is going to collapse. That's the truth. Everything, your 401k that you think you're building, I'm telling you, listen, Pastor Dan would never lie to you. I don't think. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. No, no, no. I wouldn't lie to you. I'm telling you, everything you're building for your glory someday won't pass the test of time. And we all sit in church and say amen to that. But the reality is, is that we don't get, we don't get where our energy should go. Our focus should be on the mission that Jesus gave to us. My mission on the planet is to compel people by my voice and by my gifts and by my lifestyle and by my love to come to this banquet and I'm to be an ambassador. I'm to be an ambassador for the kingdom. That's my job description. I'm an ambassador and so are you to the kingdom of God. And that's what brings great glory unto the Father. Now to do that, I have to imitate Jesus, which means that I have to be both externally focused and culturally relevant. That's, what Je that's who Jesus was. He entered into a culture. He entered into a, a time and a place. He actually was in poverty in that area of the country. He enters into that world and he speaks with kings and poor people. He is just this amazing servant of the living God. And so I want to start today. I haven't started preaching yet. <laughs> I want to start today with a question. And I'm going to tell you, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to make you really uncomfortable. And rightfully so, I need to make you uncomfortable because the saddest thing in the world for you to have happen in your life is someday at the end of your life, recognize that you gave everything you gave for the wrong thing and end up and end up in great regret because you didn't understand the truth of what God had for your life. So I want to start with this question and it's an uncomfortable question. How are you doing with the mission that you were assigned to? Your assignment is to go and to invite people that nobody else wants into the banquet. That's your assignment. 
That's what I should look for every day. On Monday morning, you know, I'm reading all sorts of stuff about how bad people dread Monday morning. I don't dread Monday morning at all. I love Monday mornings. And here's why I love Monday, mo Monday mornings. It's another opportunity, me for, opportunity for me to invite people to the banquet. So what I, it's my job description. I don't work for Grace Church. I work for God. You don't work for IGT or whoever else you're working for. You work for God and you have an assignment and you have gifts, talents, and abilities and influence and you're to be using them. And so let me see if I can help you with that question a bit. And, and probably this is going to be a little more uncomfortable question. And that is simply this. If you vanish tomorrow, let's say you go home, you're washing your car to get all the ash off your car and all of a sudden you you have a heart attack and die. Let me ask you this question. How does that affect the mission on this planet? I mean, I'm going to feel bad for you, your family at least. I'm going to feel bad for them that you're gone. You know, you probably, your kids might cry for you. Or they might say, oh, the inheritance. Okay, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying that. You know, from experience, I don't know. May, you know, the bottom line is, is this, is that, is that the question I'm asking you is, do you really matter in this assignment? Does it really matter whether you're, whether, does it, are you just taking a breath on the planet or does your assignment here really matter? And if you vanished, people would step back and go, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? That is how you should live your life. You should live your life so that you're making a difference in this world. I'm on a, I'm on a mission with Jesus and I have to embrace, I have to embrace his will for my life. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to introduce a word to you that I think is really important. And this is what everyone should be living for. If I'm going to be externally focused and culturally relevant, I should be living for the idea of impact. That's the word. Say it with me. Impact. That's what my, that's what my journey on planet Earth is all about. It is making maximum impact on all the people around me, on my family, on my neighborhood, on my church, on my city, on my state, on my world. I'm to make maximum impact on their lives. And it starts with an idea. It starts with, you know, it's not how big or how little it is. It is that I accept the assignment. Do you accept the assignment from God that you are called by God to have impact on the people around you. You accept that assignment? So if you do, we're going to have to make some changes. We're going to have to adjust our thinking along the way. I am not called to be in a holy huddle. That's what, most, that's what happens in most churches is we get in this holy huddle and we have this great fellowship and we have this great time and, and all of my needs are met and I'm just simply saying, if you never break the huddle, nothing ever gets done. We're not called to be in a holy huddle. You and I are called to have impact. I don't measure my life by wins and losses. I don't. I've got plenty of losses. Satan reminds me of all the time of how often I've dropped the ball, how often I have blown it, how often I've said the wrong thing, how often I have just messed up. I mean, I've got a, I've got a resume filled with that. And, and some of them are on, are on tape, you know, because, you know, I, I get recorded every weekend. I got a resume of times that I blew it. I don't measure wins and losses. This is what I measure. I measure impact. I don't care. This is the, uh, this is the gospel truth. I don't care whether you like me or you don't. What I care about is if you've got to deal with me and my message. And you've got to, you either got to ignore me or you've got to figure out a way to hear me. That's what I care about. I care not about the wins and losses. I care about maximum impact. And that should be your heartbeat. That should, that's, that should what should wake you up at night and go, God, show me how to have greater impact in my life. And impact is directly tied to being culturally relevant and externally focused. That's how Jesus made impact. Those two ways. So there's a guy by the name of Jim Elliott. Some of you probably have heard of him. Some of you haven't. Here's a guy who only lived to be 29 years old, and yet he had maximum impact even on the world that we exist in today. He was a missionary in Ecuador, and in 1956, he was martyred by the people he was trying to reach. And there was a whole movie that was written about him and shown on on, on, in the theaters. He was a passionate Christian who journaled, many of his thoughts and prayers and one such 
address that he wrote down was about the idea of impact. And this is what he writes. This is died at 29 years old. And today he's still quoted and still thought about in Christian circles. He said, let me not be like a milepost on a single road. Don't, don't let me be like that. And that's so interesting. He says, make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. It's like this. If you drive down Interstate 80, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but there are mile markers, right? How many of you pay attention to those mile markers? I don't. Have you seen one? You've seen them all. They just have different numbers on them. You know, hopefully they're going up or down. I, I didn't, I've never paid attention. I don't know. You know why I don't know? Because they're irrelevant to me. And that's what I don't want to be. I don't want to be irrelevant to the people around me. I want to be like that sign that says, hey, work zone ahead, slow down. Oh, I'm going to get a ticket if I don't slow down. I want to, I want to have impact on people's lives. That is what Jim Elliott was saying. And even today, 50, 50 years ago, he died as this, this martyred Steph, and he still is being read and quoted today, that's who I want to be. That's hope, I hope that's who you want to be. And the most impactful people are remembered past their lifetime. The saddest thing that could ever happen to your life is you kick the bucket. And a week later, they don't know your name. That would be sad, right? Hello out there. This is the 11 o'clock service. Good night. <laughs> When I ask a question, you can ask back. I mean, I brag about you in the other, in the other services. This is the 11 o'clock service. You're supposed to laugh at my jokes, right? I mean, you can't leave me all by myself up here. I mean, it's kind of lonely when you do that. So I don't even know where I was going with that. But I just, you know, anyway, I, want to be, I don't want to be forgotten. I want people to remember me past my life. Now, there are three ways. If I'm going to have impact, then I have to be externally focused and I have to be culturally relevant. There are three ways that I'm going to describe for you what that means in your life. Here we go. Are you ready? Well, let me start with this question. Do you even care? Do you want to have impact? So here we go. This is how you do it. Number one, externally focused people, those are the people who have impact, not internally focused people. Externally focused people are self-sacrificing Internally focused people are self-serving. So here's how it works. When you come to church, you go, a self-serving pers person says, here's what a self-serving pers person does or says to themselves, good night. I hope Pastor Dan has a good message today. I hope I don't fall asleep in church and I hope the music is, you know, on key. That's a self-serving person. An externally focused person says, I wonder who I'm going to be able to pray for today. I wonder who I can have a conversation with that's going to make a difference in their life. That's an externally focused person. That's impactful. See the difference between even how you attend church? It, you know, and I'm going to guess that in the, in, the, in the culture that you and I live, churches in America are internally focused. They're, they're focused on themselves. Christians are focused on themselves, not externally focused. And as a result... The church is inept for, for in many places because we don't have a voice because we're not impacting people's lives. Make sense? Hello? Yes? All right. So I've got to learn how to be self-sacrificing. And I watched an example of this in the Olympics just recently. I was watching Simone Biles and, uh, you know, the gymnast. This is an amazing gymnast. And uh, she, in her own right, is one of the best gymnasts in the world. And she pulls out of the Olympics uh, a few events because, because of mental health issues. And, with, you know, I don't know what they were. She didn't really elaborate on them. But I can only imagine that when you're in the world stage and everybody is wondering how you move your big toe, that's pretty stressful. I'm just saying that's pretty stressful. But I was sitting there and I was watching her performance right before she pulls out. And the commentator, when they, they announced that she was pulling out some, of several events, said, I don't know if you guys have figured this out yet or not, but let me fill the blanks in. I don't, this isn't exactly his words, but this is what he said. This is what I heard him say. He said, this is a self-sacrificing thing because by her pulling out, she's giving America the chance to win a medal, which they did, silver medal. 
she knew that she wasn't up to it. Now, think about this. Most Olympians would have said, I don't give a rip about the other people there. I've trained all of my life for the Olympics and to come hell or high water. We can say that word in the church, by the way. It's in the Bible. <laughs> come hell or high water. I'm going to just focus on me and it's going to be all about me. And if I lose, I lose. And if I win, I win. That's how most Olympians would do it. But she pulled out and behind the scenes spoke about the reason she did. And one of those reasons, not just because she had mental, some mental health issues, you know, that's great. I mean, we support that. But she also sacrificed her own career for the sake of others. That's a modern day example of what it means to be self-sacrificing. And it's very powerful. Self-sacrificing, listen to this carefully. Here's a formula, it's always true. Self-sacrificing always equals impact. I'm gonna tell you what, I'm gonna remember her name when I forget everybody else's name on that team. That's the bottom line. Self-sacrifice always equals impact. Number two, externally focused people expect to give. They walk through the door, expect to give. And I'm not talking necessarily numerically here. That could be part of it. But externally focused people expect to give. Internally focused people expect to receive. Give me something. Often, and here's where it's going to become a little more uncomfortable here. So smile at me when I say this to you. We're all friends here. You can hate me. I don't care. But here's how the average person chooses a church or stays in a church. This is how they do it. First of all, this is, they, would, they, would think, they would think this uh, on the basis of their own experience. Is the worship inspiring? That's how I'm going to choose. I want, a, I want a church that inspires me with their music. And I'm going, uh, Hello, let me just tell you this. I don't know if you know this or not, but let me just inform you, we didn't come here to worship you. <laughs> we didn't. And you didn't come here to worship me. We came here to worship the true and the living God. Amen? Amen. And so it's not about how I feel. And some of my best worship has happened in the midst of my deepest depression when I take away all of the superficial and I just explain and experience and worship the living God for who he is. That's true worship. It isn't a feeling. Sometimes, I don't, I don't, sometimes the feeling's there, sometimes it's not. But more often than not, genuine, true, self-sacrificing worship is when you give yourself away and you just give yourself unto God. So inspiring worship is one way we choose churches or moving sermons, amen? Oh, that was really, oh God. Oh, 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 oh man. I don't think my heart's beating anymore. You know, you're just, you know, that hurt, that you're cutting, me, you're cutting me to the heart here. I'm just kidding. I'm back. Okay, moving sermons. I want, I want, I want you to move me, Pastor Dan. I want you to move me. And uh, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> but the reality is, is that's not why you should choose a church. Or how about, I want to know that my kids are being taken care of because actually in our culture, we worship our kids. Who did I say that out loud? I'm in so much trouble here today. We worship our kids and, you know, and, you know, we put helmets on them when they ride bikes and we're afraid, you know, I, I said it again. I, it just came out. I'm sorry. I'm just, I lived in a different age. You have to understand. I lived in a different world. And so, so, but that's not how we choose a church. How do you choose a church? What would your criteria be? Here's how I would choose a church. I think it's right. No, I know it's right. I would choose a church based on what I can do to produce in that church. What do I give? Where can I plug in and make a difference and make an impact? How can I help the church fulfill its mission? That's how you choose a church. And while we're talking about church, thanks for being here today. Let me just say that before I say something really hard to you. Thanks for being here today. I love you. I love that you're online with this. Please don't turn me off right now. So, so here's the thing. I want to say something really, and if you get up and walk out, I'm going to call you by name right now. So just don't do that unless you have to go to the bathroom. That's a different story. No, I'm just kidding. So here we go. Um, when you think about church, I want you to think about something a little differently here today. Church 
is not the end game in the kingdom. This isn't the, this isn't the ultimate climax of, the, of this age. It's not. It's not the pinnacle. It's just not. And so we, we tend to think, you know, gosh, I showed up today, didn't I? Isn't that, isn't, isn't that all that God expects? The answer is no. So let me see if I can explain to you what the church is. The church is like the film room in the NFL. So what do you go to the film room for? You go in there to learn about the opponent. You go in there to learn about the team. You are inspired by certain things. That's, that's what you do in church. But the reality is, is the mission of the church starts when you walk out these doors. That's when your mission starts. This isn't it. This isn't the mission. It isn't, it isn't that I just got myself to church, celebrate. Well, I'm going to tell you this. This is so funny. This, I, just, I was thinking about this last night when I couldn't sleep thinking about you all and what I was going to say to you today, writing my sermon at 3 o'clock in the No, I wasn't, didn't write it at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was 4. So here's, here's, here's the reality. I, we're right in the middle, and I'm a diehard football fan. I'm just going to admit that to you. I even watch preseason games. You know, that, watching a game that doesn't matter is a, an addiction. So I, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to admit that right up front, you know, watching a game that, you know. But here's the thing. This summer, while teams are in the film room, they're not popping the champagne corks. They're just not going, woohoo, that's it, we've won. We saw the film. We're inspired. That's not it at all. They have to go now out and execute for like 16, 17 games. Is it 17 now? I think it's 17 now. And uh, I'm, I, that shows you how bad a fan I am. So... It's about execution. Church is about learning how to execute the plan. And then you walk out of this, this, these doors on mission for Jesus. And the mission, let's not lose sight of it, the mission is to go into the four corners of the world and invite people to the banquet. That's the mission. That's why you're on the planet. That's why you exist. That's why God has you here. This is just the film room. And let me just speak, let me just speak to those, the 60 people last weekend that got baptized. Amen. Awesome job. I'm so proud of you. But let me just tell you, that's not the pinnacle either. That's the beginning. That's the gun. Boom. Now you're on, now you're in a race. That's where it starts. So the goal of the Christian life isn't just to listen to me carefully, isn't just to show up to church every week and endure and endure Pastor Dan for 30 minutes and then get, a, you know, get some type of reward in heaven for that. That's not what it is at all. It is about learning more about our God so that when we go and represent, as I'm an ambassador for the kingdom, that's who I am, I represent him well. Now we come to John 15. And so this is such an amazing passage of Scripture. So I'm going to show you something here that's so good. John 15 this is Jesus. These are his words. He's telling his disciples some really important stuff for us to learn. I am the true grapevine. That's who Jesus, Jesus says this. He's the grapevine, and my father is the gardener. And he lifts up every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. Your version might say cuts off, but that word iro in Greek can either be translated lifts up or cuts off. And I think it means lift up because that's what you do with grapes. You stake them up. If you, go up to our, if you go up to our vineyard in the north parking lot, that's what we do. We stake them up. So that's, that was just free. I don't know why I said that to you. So father, the father is the gardener. He lifts up every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more fruit. Stop there for just a second. Notice how many times in this passage produce fruit happens. Actually, Twice. So far, we we have not even finished with it yet. Produce fruit. Your purpose is to produce fruit. You can't do it on your own. It isn't that you have to labor harder. It's that you have to surrender more. The more you're surrendered and dependent upon God, the more he works in you and the more fruit he produces. And then this, notice this, he says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. There's that word again, produce fruit. Do you get the idea that Jesus wants us to produce fruit? That's the goal of the Christian life. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And here we go again. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. True disciples produce much fruit. 
This brings great glory to my Father. So I'm not here to serve myself. I'm not here to receive. I'm here to give. I'm to let God's Spirit pour out in my life. You're to let God's Spirit pour out in your life. And you are to give Him the glory by doing that. Giving equals impact. That's what it does. Giving equals impact. Thirdly, lastly, outward focused people serve unconditionally. They don't choose what they're going to do. Externally focused people don't ever say no to Jesus. No, I'm not going to teach fourth grade boys. Really? You know, the last time that I said no to Jesus, I said, this, this is so good. Last time I said no to Jesus, I said, I will never live in L.A. And six months after those words came out of my mouth, I was living in the heart of L.A., going to school. I just learned, I'm not going to say no to you again. I just think externally focused people always find a way to say, yes, God. What do you want me to do? Yes, I, I'll do that. Internally focused people serve conditionally. Some things are just, some things are just too hard for you if you're externally focused. But you don't get the, the point. They're all too hard. And God works in our lives and, and moves inside of us. And he does it, not us. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. Serving unconditionally means you'll never say, you'll never say, no, I'll never do that. And uh, serving unconditionally, listen to me carefully, always equals impact. It always does. So I have a video I want you to watch of an opportunity. And this, you may not, this may not be your opportunity. I just wanted to show you a couple that has learned how to say yes to whatever Jesus asked them to do. So watch this video. It was Hurricane Harvey. I saw an image of elderly people sitting waist deep in water, the floodwaters of the hurricane, and it just broke my heart. And knowing that she, that was her desire to, to serve people in this disaster uh, relief capacity, I, I just felt compelled to, to go. And so I walked up to her office in the middle of her work day and said, uh, we need to go to Houston, we need to help out. And so we did. It was in that week that we really realized that we never wanted other people to not know what it's like to be able to uh, say yes to showing up for people who are in pain. So we are on mission to just help as many people understand and know how simple it is and how effective it is and how transformational it really is. We know that God puts this on the hearts of a lot of people. So they have the desire, but they don't have the knowledge of where they can help. Samaritan's Purse Organization has been a great way to serve and have meaningful impact in a situation. We've done it, it's simple, it's effective, and we want other people to know that their ability to show up for other people is meaningful too. And so we're here to equip and empower other people. That's why we wanted to bring Samaritan's Purse to Grace Church to grow the team here. I want to remind you one more time, serving always equals impact. When I say yes to Jesus, there's a reason for it. And he has somebody that I'm supposed to impact. Remember the mission. The mission is that I'm to go to the four corners of the world, the places no one else goes, and invite people to the banquet. That's my mission. It's not to build wealth. It is not to build a reputation. It is simply to serve Jesus in the ways he wants you to serve. And when you do that, it is a powerful, powerful thing. Amen.